Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so excited to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder and storytelling to change our world for the better. And we believe that everyone of every identity and experience should be able to safely explore the wonders of our world. We stand in support of human dignity, respect and justice and our Explorer Classroom events connect students from all around the world with National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and extended Q&As. This past Monday, June 8th, was a holiday. It was World Oceans Day, which is the day for people all around the world to come together and celebrate the ocean we share, to learn about it, and to start working to protect it. And on Explorer Classroom, a single day is just it's not enough to celebrate our ocean. So we've continued celebrating World Oceans Day all week long. And today we're very lucky to be joined by Erica Wolsey for a 360 virtual scuba experience to finish off our ocean week in style. Um, everyone watching along at home, we've got so many different ways for you to participate in this. You could use a phone, you could use a laptop, you could use a Google Cardboard or your own headset. Whatever you're working with will work for us. Erica is going to give you some more instructions in a little bit. But for now, I want to tell you a little bit about who she is and how cool it is that she's joining us. Erica is a marine biologist and the CEO of The Hydrus, which is a nonprofit that uses emerging technologies like virtual reality to connect people to the ocean. Today, she's going to teach us just a little bit about her work and then lead us through a 360 immersive experience on a virtual scuba dive to the coral reefs of Palau. But before we get to that, I do want to acknowledge that we're joined on screen by several wonderful groups uh, and that there's many, many more of you out there watching along on YouTube. Hi, everyone. Our registered students today represent Alabama, Arizona, Brazil, California, Canada, the District of Columbia, Delaware, Florida, Hawaii, Iowa, Illinois, India, Kentucky, Liberia, Massachusetts, Maryland, Mexico, Mississippi, Nebraska, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Romania, South Carolina, Texas, the United Kingdom, Virginia, Washington, Wisconsin, and probably more places too. Um, so if I have missed your state or your country, please say hi, introduce yourself in the chat bar. We would love to give you a shout out and say hello. But for now, that is plenty from me. And it's finally time to turn it over to Erica Woolsey for today's Explorer Classroom lesson and virtual dive. Wow, thank you so much, Celeste. I'm so happy to be here and celebrate Oceans Week with you and everybody joining us on this virtual dive. So as Celeste mentioned, I'm a National Geographic Explorer and a marine biologist. And so my favorite place to be on earth is underwater. And so lately I've been having to settle for just like a underwater zoom background like this one. Here we have the coral reefs of Palau with some schooling uh, Moorish idols behind me. And one of my other favorite things to do is not only to be underwater, but to bring people with me underwater. And I am a dive master. I am a kayak guide. I love bringing people to the ocean. Of course, that's not always possible, especially now. So my team and I have been trying to create ways with the help of amazing partners like Celeste and National Geographic, we wanna create, create ways to bring the ocean to you. So before we go diving together, I wanna do what's called a dive briefing. So this is where we go over how we're gonna communicate underwater, what you're gonna to expect to see, and then I'll give you some more instructions about how to do it in this virtual space. So this is going to be a nine minute dive. We're in the Republic of Palau in the Western Pacific Ocean on a tropical coral reef. And our maximum depth is gonna be about 25, 30 meters. So that's about 100, 100 feet below the surface. And of course, when we're diving and have a regulator in our mouth to breathe air, you know, you can't really talk to everybody. So when you're diving, you have to use hand signals to communicate. So the first one I want us all to try together is this one. So the dive signal here means, okay. And it's a question and an answer. So if I were to go, are you okay? You would say, I'm okay. Ready? Are you okay? All right, got a lot of good okays. Thank you so much. 
Now, if you're floating on the surface after a dive, and I want to say, are you okay? But you're too far away, I can't make out the hand. You can tap your head like this. So this is a signal for a safe diver. And so safety is the most important thing when we're diving together as a team. Fabulous, thank you. Now, some fun signals are the animals that we're gonna see. So how about turtle? So this is what the signal for turtle looks like. You put one hand flat on top of the other and wiggle your thumbs. Nice, seeing a lot of good turtles, very good. Now, what do you think the signal is for shark? Because we might see some sharks. Oh, I see it. Yep, very good. So this is the signal for shark. So if you see a shark, make sure to signal to your dive buddies that there's a shark up ahead. And keep in mind that all of these sharks that we're diving with are big fish and they are very gentle and enjoying their own habitat. All right, how about manta rays? So I've heard that we might be seeing some manta rays on this dive. Ooh, Celeste has a really good one. So you can be big like this and wave your arms, or if you don't have enough space, this is a nice little manta ray. Awesome. So, and when we go diving together, when we get started, I'm gonna ask if you're okay, and then I'm gonna say, all right, let's go. And that means let's descend. It doesn't mean, no, this is bad. It means let's go down. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. There are a few different ways to join the video, join the 360 dive. And one is that um, with this QR code. So if you have a smartphone, what you need to do here is open your camera app and move it over the QR code on this Manta belly and then open the video in the YouTube app. Now, if that's what you're doing, don't get started yet because we all wanna dive together. So pause yourself and hold on. And when you do that, you can just watch it on your phone and drag with your finger, or you can press the icon for the 360 viewer that looks like a little headset or dive mask, which splits the screen so you can turn it sideways. And if you have a cardboard viewer, you can turn your phone sideways in there and watch this way. Okay, so that's one way to do it. If you have a smartphone, you can drag with your finger. You can also move your phone around, whatever works for you. Now, if you don't have an available smartphone or a cardboard viewer, there are a couple other ways that you can join. One is my great team here at Nat Geo will be showing the film on the 2D screen in this experience. Or you can use the link that's in the chat to go to a new browser and have the 360 experience where you click and drag. Does that sound good? Does everyone have a plan? Okay, so now that we're ready and we've done our safety check, we are going to descend together. Enjoy your dive. And don't forget to turn up your volume because it has narration and it has sound.
How's everyone feeling? Everyone doing okay? Awesome. And we have our safe divers back on the surface. Amazing. So why don't we climb onto the boat and do a quick debrief? I would love to hear how that went. I want to thank you so much for coming diving with me. And please, maybe I can hear from the Walker family first. What was that like? What did you notice? Do you notice? Um, we're being, we're, okay. That was like, the, the shark that came up above us was really cool. Awesome. What do you want to say? How did it feel diving? Do you it like was pretty diving? cool. I'm sorry. so glad. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mary Beth, do either of you have any impressions? What was that like? That was really neat. We watched it on three different devices. So we got a lot of different angles, um, but we really enjoyed it. We enjoyed getting to go on land um, and then underwater. It was neat to see kind awesome. of the whole, how the whole habitat works together. Thank you. I'm glad you had so many options to, to make the trip. Sankiche. What was it like for you? Uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, we we enjoyed it. Um, Nico, what did you like the most? Uh, shark. The sharks. The sharks. Right. Can you do the shark signal for me? Nice. Yeah, we saw a lot oh, of sharks. Did, what did you like? <laughs> they got pretty close, right? Yeah. And once when I was in school, uh, my uh, my my person that does church for us in the church, he showed us a real shark tooth. Oh, that's really Whoa, cool. Whoa, amazing. Well, it <laughs> sounds like sharks are a fan favorite. Isn't it great that we could go swimming with them and enjoy their habitat? Yeah. Without right. having to be scared or get wet. You didn't have to go in the water to be close to them, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Sankiche and family. Mr. Piercy's class, I'd love to hear what that was like for you. And I know you're experimenting with other types of ways to use the technology. Yeah, what'd you guys think? You're, you're unmuted now, you can talk. What'd you guys think? Uh, it was cool. It was yeah, cool. I thought it was good. Like they, really they were asking questions. They all wanted to know, like, what type of camera did you use to film that? Ah, that's a great question. So we used a really special underwater 360 camera called the Virtual 2, which is basically 13 different individual cameras that are traditional cameras that face in one direction, but they were mounted together, all looking outwards in underwater housing. And so we spent a lot of time, we have an amazing production team stitching all of the images together so that as you turn, you can see in all directions. And Mr. Piercy's class, what an awesome segue for me because it's now time for questions. <laughs> How wonderful. Thank you, Erica, that was awesome. I'm getting a little stir crazy at home. I'm sure that some of you folks out there can relate to that as well. It was great to take a little tropical break <laughs> and, and go down a hundred feet underwater and just marvel at the ocean. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. And Thank you for so folks much. learning along at home, we would love to see what you do with this. Maybe you do a follow-up activity from the family guide. You draw a picture, write a story, make your own photo sphere or lead your family and friends through their own virtual dive, whatever it may be, we would love to see it. Um, you can send it to us on Twitter by tagging at NatGeoEducation and using hashtag Explore Classroom. That way we can make sure Erica gets the chance to see all of your awesome work. I would love yeah. that. And you can even go to my Hydrus website. So search for the Hydrus. And on our page, you have a bunch of follow-up activities for this dive. Awesome. Well, folks, if you're watching along on live, keep using that YouTube chat bar. It's not just for turtle emojis. It's also for all of your questions. We record absolutely everything that you send in. So please only send your question once. Please don't spam us. And if you're up here on screen with me, get some questions ready and get your nice loud voice ready. I'll let you know when it's your turn. But our first question for you, Erica, comes to us from Luigi and Sophia 
who are wondering what it was in the ocean that was creating those little pink bubble things. Oh, yes. So in that CGI animation, when we see it all around you, that was coral spawning. So imagine all of those pink bubbles were really, really tiny, like much smaller than just a fingernail. And that's how corals reproduce. So a lot of the coral animals that build the reef habitat that support this incredible ecosystem, they reproduce by releasing eggs and sperm into the water. And it happens once a year around the full moon. And these little pink bundles filled with those cells float up to the surface. So it's like being in an underwater pink snow globe. And that was meant to show how coral ecosystems can persevere and reproduce and continue surviving. And so it's a really fabulous thing to recreate because so few people get to see coral spawning. And it also is a message of hope for the future. That is awesome. And our next most popular question in the chat bar is what type of sharks were those? Those were gray reef sharks. And I've been so fortunate to dive with so many different species of sharks. And most often they're just swimming around doing their own thing. And those gray reef sharks, I think they can get to be about seven feet long. And so it's really cool to swim with them and watch them in the currents. Um, and those gray reef sharks like to hang out on coral reefs. So I get to see them all the time. Awesome. Well, let's go to the walkers for our next question. Maybe Anna or Soren have, have a question for you. You got a question? Um, why do the manta rays were like, why were there big groups of manta rays? Ooh, great question, Soren. So the manta rays generally school together for a few reasons. They uh, like to feed together and quite often manta rays aggregate. So they come into groups in areas that have lots of food. So they have these big open mouths. I don't know if you could see inside their mouths during the dive, but basically they filter seawater through their mouths and out their gills. And they are collecting small pieces of food that are in the water. So what are known as plankton. So really small animals or plants. And that's how they feed and that's how they eat. And so in areas where there's lots of currents, they come together and they swim in circles. Sometimes they do these flips or barrel rolls to filter the water through their mouths or they're going in straight lines to, um, to collect and, and feed. And they're also social animals. They, they're schooling and often travel in groups. So neat. And we've got Rin deep in the chat bar who is wondering, Erica, is it more common that fish are dying off because the coral they live on dies or is it more common that they're dying because we're killing them? Unfortunately, both are very common. So when it comes to fisheries and fish stocks, um, many fish are being overfished. Um, so if they're not caught in thoughtful, sustainable ways, um, it can be very damaging to that ecosystem. So from top down in terms of the fish to the reef, it has an effect. And if you destroy the reef, which is the habitat for the fish, it has sort of bottom up effect. So it's sort of being hit from both sides. And so I would encourage you to, if you are a seafood eater, to um, make sure that wherever you get your seafood is sustainably and ethically caught. Awesome. Or harvested. And you've told me before about a really great app for that. Would you remind me of what it is? Yes, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has an amazing app called Seafood Watch. And so it's a free app for your phone. And anytime you're out at a restaurant or at the, at the store, you can search and see you know, what type of seafood is, is healthy for you and healthy for the planet. Amazing. Well, let's take our next question from Mr. Piercy's class. Let's go for it, folks. Oh, I spoke too soon. Mr. Pierce's class, would you unmute and then go for it? Sure. Caitlin has a question that she'd like to ask about the film. Yes. How long did it take? Uh, I can't talk anymore. How long did it take to make that video? How long did it take to make the film? Not sure if you heard that. So it took a lot of months to plan, uh, especially with the equipment we use. But once we were there, we were in Palau for about T just under two weeks, maybe 10 or 11 days. And we collected like 50 terabytes or something ridiculous. Um, so a lot of footage 
that we took off of the island and we brought back and spent many months editing and stitching and again, amazing production team at the Hydras and mainly Horizon Productions. Um, and they made it look seamless and tried to recreate what it was like to be on a virtual dive. So took a while, but definitely worth it because um, it means we get to take more and more people diving. Aurelia K has a kind of related question. They're wondering how did the wildlife you were filming react to being on video and being near all of your gear? That's a great question. And first I'll say that um, you may have noticed the scene where I'm really close to a manta ray doing barrel rolls in front of me. And one of my very strict rules as a diver is not to harass or chase or interfere with marine life. And so that's why I was floating patiently with my hands crossed. Um, I don't want to stress out any animals. And that said, uh, so much of our footage was very lucky because you know, fish don't take direction. And it seemed like they were aware of our presence um, and quite often would avoid us or swim away. Like I said, we wouldn't chase them or force them to do anything they didn't want to do. Um, but that's a really great question because not only might camera equipment affect how animals underwater behave, but also just the presence of divers. And we're quite noisy underwater. We're blowing bubbles all the time. You know, we're making like grunting noises or banging our tanks. And so um, I think that's a really important question uh, that I think we should all think about when we're underwater. How is our presence affecting the life here? And if it's affecting them negatively, how can we change what we do? Amazing. Well, let's see if Maylee or Mary Beth have any questions. Let's go for it, folks. Good. Okay, so have you ever um, seen any sunken ships or submarines that have airspace in there with, and you can go inside without using an air tank? That is such an excellent question. <laughs> I have been lucky enough to dive on sunken ships and they're called wreck dives, W-R-E-C-K dives. Um, and it's, it's definitely a really fun experience for divers to explore and you get to see you know, different artifacts and you hear different stories about how the ship ended up being there. I have never been on a ship where there's an air pocket, although I've heard stories about that and I know that a lot of people like to free dive, meaning that they dive without their equipment and they might be able to find a little airspace to breathe, including in underwater caverns. So like the cenotes in Mexico, you can dive under and then pop up into a little cavern and um, you know, spend a little time there before coming out. However, it can be quite dangerous and uh, quite complicated. So I, for one, would need a lot of extra training and I would need to have a lot of people on my team uh, with me to make sure I can do something like that safely. Oh yeah. Well, Melody and Nobu are wondering if you could explain a little bit about the 3D coral models that you make and yes. how that works. Yes, in fact, um, I have one across the room here. Maybe I'll go grab it, but um, we really are interested in visualizing coral reefs. And so what we do when we're diving underwater, we have a special underwater camera, which just takes 2D traditional photographs and we swim around the object, like in a circle, we swim around the coral reef uh, and we stitch all of those photos together to create a three dimensional digital model. And so that process is called photogrammetry. And what it does is it recreates the coral but it doesn't harm the coral. So it's a really cool way to explore and understand and collect marine life without damaging it or hurting it. And so a lot of our digital models that we've collected in the wild are available open access. Again, look at our website. We have it posted to Sketchfab. And we're also, um, we can 3D print them. So you can have a physical object that is a reproduction of a real coral that we hope is alive and well on the reef. And you might've even seen in the film, when we were in the classroom in Palau, we put thermochromic paint, special type of paint on the coral models so that when you put them in warm water, they go from colorful to white, which is a cool way to visualize and teach about the phenomenon of coral bleaching. 
Um, well, let's see if Sankiche, Nico, and Vida have any questions. Go for it, folks. Okay, Vida, you had a question. What would you like to ask uh, Erica? How, how do you guys get the, how can you swim with those suits on? Great question. So the suits, the long suits that cover my arms and legs, that's made of a material called neoprene. And what that wetsuit does is it keeps me warm. Even if the water is pretty warm on the surface, which is usually what it's like um, in the tropics, the deeper you go, the colder it gets. And I'm kind of a wuss with cold water. So it helps me maintain my body temperature. And it's quite flexible so I can bend my arms and swim and everything. And in fact, it's wetsuits are so comfortable. I would wear a wetsuit and live in a wetsuit every day if I could. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we've got Peyton who's wondering how many dives you've been on total, Erica. And we've got David who's wondering what your favorite part about scuba diving is. Ooh, great questions. Um, let's see. Well, I've been diving for, gosh, almost 20 years now. And I think in that time, I also am not the best at, at logging every single dive I do. So uh, my log dives are probably somewhere in uh, the 600s, but uh, I think I've done a, a few more than that. <laughs> and I, that means I've been able to spend a lot of hours underwater and exploring. And regarding my favorite part about diving is not only seeing really interesting things that I would never ever see on land or even could imagine and observing them and asking questions about them, which is my favorite thing to do as a scientist is to observe and ask questions. I also just love the, the feeling and the sensation of floating underwater and diving in a, in a lot of ways is just controlled floating and finding a way to stay steady in the water column, making sure you're not, you know, it takes a while to not flail or hit anything, um, including other divers. But after a certain number of dives, I can control my buoyancy with my breath. And there's something very meditative and calming about that, being able to see and hear your breath and not speaking, but just listening and observing. That's, I mean, I think I'm going a little stir crazy now that I think about it, not being able to be submerged in water on a regular basis. <laughs> it's maybe more of your natural habitat than it the might land be. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's visit the walkers again and see if they have another question. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, so when, how old were you, do you think, when you realized this is what you wanted to do with your life? Oh, good question. Um, I was probably in uh, my undergrad, so maybe like 2021. 20, I had already started diving uh, as a teenager. And when I went to college, I actually was studying to be a doctor of medicine. So I'm a doctor of marine science now, but I was interested in being a physician and helping people uh, you know, care for people that are sick. And I started studying biology really intensely, doing a lot of math and science. And I found this amazing opportunity to study marine biology uh, at uh, my college's marine lab. And so I just got distracted by all the cool stuff in the ocean. So I think when I was in my early twenties, I, I really started focusing on marine science and um, looking at particular ecosystems, including coral reefs, which I ended up getting a scholarship to study in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef, which was a, an absolute dream come true. And um, I just have been ve very fortunate to follow my curiosities. Awesome. We've got an easy one for you. We've got LK Hawkins, who's wondering what your very favorite marine animal is. Ooh, that's a, that's a hard question. Um, I really like coral <laughs> because it's what I study uh, and it's what I've spent a lot of time and, and effort learning about and understanding. However, I really encourage you to Google nudibranchs <laughs> because they are so cool. They're these small sea slugs that come in all shapes and colors and are so interesting. So N-U-D-I, B-R-A-N-C-H, nudibranchs, check it out. Plus, I also have had the amazing opportunity to dive with big animals like uh, sea lions and sharks and whale sharks are absolutely amazing. So I like to think that I give you know, equal love from the really small things 
to the really big charismatic megafauna. Love that. Let's go back to Mr. Piercy's class. Go for it, folks. So one of the, I've got students this year who are obsessed with great white sharks and they all want to know if you've ever had the chance to swim with one either in a cage or outside of a cage. I have actually. In fact, um, I live in San Francisco and just off the coast here is one of the largest what are called in science white shark populations. So they can be called great white sharks, they can call, be called white sharks, they can be called white pointers. But one of the largest populations in the world, if not the largest, they migrate from just off of the California coastline to Hawaii every year to, to feed and to mate and they go back and forth. And I had the amazing experience several years ago where there was a special trip to the Farallon Islands just off of the Golden Gate Bridge. So out to sea for maybe an hour boat ride. And it's a marine protected area. And so they weren't allowed to do all of the things that a lot of other cage diving does, which is to throw fish guts and blood in the water to really rile the sharks up. Um, rather they had this, uh, this cutout of carpet in the shape of a sea lion on a rope that was meant to attract the sharks. However, what I loved is that um, it wasn't guaranteed to see a shark, but when I got in the cage and I was one of the lucky few people who got to see a huge great white shark swim right by me. And I think part of it was, and the light just coming down, it was just absolutely gorgeous, an amazing moment. And one of the most interesting things is because we weren't putting bait in the water, they were just calmly swimming by and wanted nothing to do with me. I thought that was really interesting. Still, I don't think I would have gotten out of the cage. That's fair. Um, we've got some questions about coral. We've got Asha who's wondering how long coral live and Ben who's wondering how many different types of coral there are out there. Oh my gosh. Well, I'll start with saying that there are over a thousand different types of coral and it includes tropical reef building corals like the ones behind me and the ones you saw in Palau. It includes soft corals, so like sea fans and and things like that and sea whips, as well as deep water cold coral. Uh, so there are so many different types that live all over the world. And in terms of how old they are, coral reefs have been around for many hundreds of thousands of years. In fact, um, the, the coral reefs we have now on the Great Barrier Reef are you know, about 10,000 years old or so. And an individual coral colony is theoretically immortal because it keeps reproducing itself. So corals can clone themselves. So the little polyps can basically split into two polyps and that's how they grow and that's how they build the reef when they're secreting the calcium carbonate limestone. And um, not only can they reproduce asexually like that by um, splitting and budding and, and uh, cloning themselves is they also reproduce through sexual reproduction, which was the spawning that you were able to experience. That said, there are a lot of things that can kill coral. Um, so a coral colony might not live that long if you know, an anchor falls on it or if a storm you know, rips it off of the reef. So there are a lot of reasons that it can die. And, and also there are fish, a lot of fish eat coral polyps, which is a natural part of things. And right now with a lot that's going on with coral reef degradation and especially spawning events is the question of whether it can regenerate and regrow through these different methods of reproduction. And there are coral colonies that are so huge that because they've been growing for thousands of years or hundreds of years. And uh, the question now is can they regenerate and regrow at the rate of of how things are changing and can they keep up with all these changes in the ocean? Good questions. Well, let's go to San Kiche again and see if there's more questions there. Hi, I have a question. Um, I'd like to know what's your deepest depth that you've gone to and if you ever got hey. to swim next to any like bioluminescent organisms. Great question. Um, so I'm a pretty uh, conservative diver. I also, the things I study, I don't have to go that deep for. So little over a hundred feet is my max limit. Um, and beyond that, I would need some extra training and extra gear. 
to be a tech diver or uh, be a rebreather diver. So some of my colleagues, they go down really deep, like hundreds of feet to explore and study and collect the animals down there. And bioluminescence is one of my favorite things in the world. I'm so glad you brought that up, San Kiche. So I love going on night dives where at night you get in the water and dive and you have a flashlight or a torch and bioluminescence is this amazing natural phenomenon where all these animals can light up and there's even stuff floating in the water. I mentioned plankton earlier that will light up if it's agitated. And so even if I'm just swimming in a black, dark nighttime ocean and I, I never turn my flashlight off, instead I put it against my chest so it turns dark. And if I move my hand in front of my face, just moving the water around, it'll start to sparkle and light up because of all of the plankton in the water that I'm you know, gently agitating, it'll, they'll start flashing. I've also had the amazing opportunities to like discover a special type of bioluminescent sea star or starfish at great depths off the Great Barrier Reef and they would sparkle and flash green and there are all sorts of types of jellyfish and tinafores and some have like rainbow little sparkles and it just it's just something that's just so otherworldly and exciting um, and really really fun so bioluminescence is definitely something I love to see when I get the chance. Amazing well let's visit Mary Beth and Maylee again. Yeah, we each have a quick question. So how are you using your research and your data for good once you collect all this footage or, you know, these species, how are you using that? And um, have you ever seen the immortal jellyfish before? Yes, great questions. Um, you sure, sure do know a lot over there, Maylee. Um, so uh, I am really interested in making science public and accessible. So I going through a PhD program and conducting research and publishing, um, I found that fewer people were aware of the work I was doing because I got so specialized. And a big part of what I want for the world is a, you know, a, an accessibility to scientific discovery and a translation of science into public understanding. And so a big part of what I do with the Hydras is work on translating that scientific discovery into public understanding. And that includes my own research that I've conducted over the years, as well as the research of my amazing colleagues working in the ocean space. And so I hope that that makes positive impact on the world of making both science and ocean environments more available and um, discoverable to, to more people. And uh, with regards to the immortal jellyfish, the hydra, I've had the great pleasure of uh, viewing them in the lab. In fact, one of my good friends in college, her, her job in her university lab was to keep that thing alive because you know, it's immortal, but you do have to feed it. <laughs> you do have to keep it alive. Um, so if given the chance, some, some organisms just can just keep on trucking. So amazing. And Erica, for our last question, do you have any advice for all the young explorers out there diving with us today? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, the thing that I found the best is to have a mindset of curiosity and discovery and keep observing and keep asking questions and really follow your curiosities. Some people say to follow your passions, which I think is part of it too, but I really want you to follow the questions and, and keep asking and keep discovering no matter what you do, whether you become a, an explorer or a marine biologist or something completely different because it's that discovery and that sharing that will really conserve and protect and appreciate our incredible blue planet. Awesome. Well, folks, thank you so much for joining us on Explorer Classroom's very first 360 dive. Thank you so much, Erica, for sharing it with us. It was awesome. You folks at home can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. Be sure to check out the Hydrus's educational resources as well and to share your work with us on Twitter. Um, and I'd love to announce that next week, the week of June 15th, we'll begin Explore Classroom's summer schedule. So instead of broadcasting every day at 2 p.m. Eastern, 
every school day. Now we're going to do Wednesdays and Thursdays throughout our summer break. So we hope to see you on Wednesdays and Thursdays from now on. Happy Pride Month, everyone. And now it's time to turn on everybody's microphones nice and loud. Let's sign off by telling Erica goodbye and thank you. Ready? Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for coming diving with me.